So we now have a completely clean log book. We don't even have anything unlocked. Are you really, really sure? Wait, can I have it back, please? So this is what the logbook looks like normally. A whole bunch of stuff that's uh, not filled out. And at the very beginning of Monster Train, you can only play with uh, a couple of clans. By the sacred ledger, no, no. Oh, that's right, we'll have to do all the challenge mode runs again, too. I forgot about those. Those are good as well. So, I guess we'll have to get that log logbook back the hard way by filling it out one run at a time. So, with that said, what? Twitch chat is Monster Train. Welcome to my second favorite deck building roguelite, Monster Train. This is a similar genre to, but very different conceptually from Slay the Spire. Welcome to Hell. Your train is carrying precious cargo, the last remaining shard of the pyre needed to relight the fires in the depths of Hell. Invaders from heaven, the winged will do anything to prevent you from completing your journey. You must make wise decisions and build up your band of monsters to have any hope of success. Good luck, Hellborn. So, in your first run of Monster Train, you don't get to choose your clan. That's only something that becomes uh, available later. There's five, uh, sorry, with the DLC now, six total clans in Monster Train. These clans are each like uh, different characters, each add a different subset of cards and monsters that you get to use for your run. Normally at the start of a run, you get some starting nodes to collect here, but on the very first run of Monster Train, you won't have any of that. Your mechanics are a little bit simplified. Let's take a look at the starting deck and talk about real quick um, how the, the basic units of Monster Train work. To start, we have a champion, the Hornbreaker Prince, as well as a bunch of restores and torches. These are the starter cards of the Hellhorned and Awoken clans, respectively. You get five copies of each, and then four copies of the basic starter unit, Train Steward. They're basic little five, eight combatants. They're quite weak, but uh, they're useful early on. Your starting deck is capable of dealing with the first combat and then not much besides. You'll have to add some more powerful units and get them upgraded quickly if you want to have any chance of surviving. That's right, we won't have the alternate champions available until we unlock them. So, generally speaking, the decisions in Monster Train are the cards that you pick after each combat. We'll talk more about combat in a second. But then after each combat, We'll get a card reward, and we can also choose left or right on a train path. The train has to take one of these two tracks, and which one you visit decides which nodes you'll get along the map. You can actually see the whole progression all the way through the eight circles, uh, nine circles of hell to the very end here with Seraph. You can, you can take a look at all the different choices you'll be offered, but there's not a whole lot of reason to look too far ahead. The one major thing that I'll point out about the nodes in Monster Train are Hell Vents. You're guaranteed to see at least two of these on every single run, and they allow you to duplicate any card in your deck. So something that you not only have constant access to, but outright can plan your run around in this game is the ability to duplicate your best card. So a lot of successful strategies in this game involve making one really powerful card and then creating more copies of it. So how does actual combat work in Monster Train? Let's jump into a fight and talk about that. Heaven's Priests. These disciples have dedicated themselves to the service of Heaven and will attempt to restore the life of their companions. So at the very top, our Pyre. This is our health. If it takes too much damage from enemy attacks, our run is over. And enemies join at the bottom of the train. In traditional wedding train fashion, this train has three vertical layers. So a bottom, a middle, and a top. Um, if you look around the countryside, you can see these everywhere, really. And they're, they're quite remarkable sights as they go through destroying bridges and such. Anywho. Our three-tiered train here is uh, essentially a three-layered defensive fortress and our opponents will have to pass through three layers of our setup in order to reach the pyre. 
We are most certainly the baddies. This is the last shard of the pyre of hell. And we're looking to reignite it and save hell. It's good stuff. So how Monster Train at its core works. Each layer of the train is, is sort of a turn of combat. Or rather, enemies move up the train uh, at a rate of one layer per turn. The turns are mechanically somewhat similar to Slay the Spire. You've got three energy in this game called Ember per turn, and you draw a base of five cards per turn. Although the exact mechanism of the drawing works a little bit differently than normal. A bit more on that. So cards like Torch can be played from your hand for a fairly straightforward effect, but there's also unit cards. These are totally different than in Slay the Spire. Units are placed on one of the three floors of the train. We're gonna put uh, we're gonna put our train steward and our hornbreaker prince here on the bottom. There's only a limited amount of space on each floor for units, indicated by the yellow pips here, and every unit card indicates the number of spaces that it takes up at the very top there. You can see the two yellow pips at the top of Hornbreaker Prince. Very, very useful mechanic in Monster Train is the combat preview. Over the health of each unit and a small little number here, you can see the current expected change to that unit's health if you hit end turn. Uh, this calculator is infallible, will always report accurate numbers and takes everything into account, which can really help you learn the game's mechanics. If what the game says is happening doesn't match up with what you think is going to happen, it's because of a mechanic that you're not understanding proper properly. <clears throat> so, when you press end turn, several things happen. Firstly, all the cards in your hand go to your discard pile, just like in Slay the Spire. Secondly, combat occurs on every floor of the train. Enemies strike first. Note that enemies are here on the right and our units are on the left, the demonic armored looking figures here. Each unit attacks with its attack value, striking the enemy in the front. So this Forge Disciple strikes the front train steward, dealing two damage to it. Then after the enemies go, our units go. The train steward will attack the Forge Disciple for five, the Hornbreaker Prince will attack for six times two, so 17 damage. And then at the end, this priest will heal five, so the Forge Disciple won't take as much. But we can kill the Forge Disciple with a torch. Enemies in Monster Train tend to come in, at least basic enemies, tend to come in three varieties. You have frontline high health units that have, at the start, about 20 health. By the end of the game, about 200 health. These are units that you're expected to kill with your own units. They don't do very much damage, but they have a lot of health, and they'll deal a lot of damage to your pyre if they reach it. There's also low health, high damage backline units, usually located behind these frontliners. We don't see any here, but there's some crossbow guys that would deal five and have one health. By the end of the game, they have about 10 health, so their health tends to stay in the single digits. These are easier to kill with spells than they are to kill with your units. And then lastly, there are support units. Also going in the back, they have pretty low health and provide all kinds of supplemental effects, be it healing or shielding or the ability to bypass your units on a floor, and they can be quite nasty. But those are also usually easier to dispatch with spells than units. All told, a successful monster train run needs to be able to answer all of the different types of enemy units. The weak backliners and the chunky frontliners both. Any surviving units at the end of the turn advance to the next floor. Let's slow down the combat a little bit so people can see uh, exactly what's happening. There's a nice little game speed toggle in this game, so you can you have a lot of control over exactly the speed at which the action moves. All right, we want to make sure this enemy dies before it gets to the shard of the pyre. The pyre itself has combat stats, but note that because enemies strike first, any enemy that reaches the pyre, generally speaking, is going to hurt you. So I think we should put a train steward here on the middle floor. Catch this enemy for five. We can finish them off with Torch. And then I guess Torch this backliner too. That way you're dead. We don't have enough energy to play these heals, but that's fine. 
So this should be a little bit easier to follow for uh, for new. We won't leave it on this speed for the whole run, but we'll put it on slow for the first combat and keep it kind of slow for this run. So after a few waves of enemies, there'll be a brief respite. The waves remaining counter will also have reached one, and after that, a boss will enter on the next wave. Um, bosses are different than normal enemies, quite substantially. Bosses have much higher combat stats, usually way more health, um, and do a bit more damage. And most importantly, they have the Relentless ability, indicated by this crown icon beneath them. Relentless means that rather than advancing up to the next floor after combat occurs, instead combat will occur between the units on the floor over and over until one side has been vanquished here. And the turn preview indicates that. So we're going to lose the train steward and the boss will die. I don't have to play any of my cards, but I could perhaps improve our outcome a little bit by playing a few. But let's just show what the Relentless does here. Everybody takes their turn, and then a new turn starts. The boss gets another attack. So on and so forth. Until one side is vanquished. Alright, we get 50 bucks and two card picks here. Allowing us to begin forming a strategy for our run here. We get the spell Hornbreak, which can kill backline units really well, or two imps, which are units that provide bonuses upon being summoned. Either a molting imp, which does AoE damage upon being summoned, or a fledgling imp, giving us rage. I think going rage is a pretty good idea for stacking our damage. Um so we do have a multi-striking Hornbreaker Prince. It's a nice little one-pip unit, too. Rage is a damage bonus status effect. Note there are a lot of keywords in this game, so it can be a little overwhelming in that regard, but usually keywords are specific to a faction. So if you focus on playing one or two factions early, there won't be too many keywords. I think I like taking this fledgling in. We want a way to boost the damage of the Hornbreaker Prince such that we can do better damage to those big frontline units. And to bosses, too. And then Vine Graphs, which can move a unit to the front. This can be quite useful for picking off annoying backline enemies. can also use it to reposition our own units. Wildwood Sap applies Regeneration. Or Restoration Detonation restores health. Take the Vine Grasp. That's cool, that's cool. All right, so now we get our first important choice, a Merchant of Steel or a Merchant of Magic. At Merchants, you can purchase upgrades for your cards. In Monster Train, unlike in Slay the Spire, upgrades work a little bit differently. Each card has two upgrade slots, currently not visible, but we can see them at the shop, uh, into which upgrade stones are slotted, and those stones have effects that are specific to them. Looks like we don't get a Merchant of Steel for a while, so I'm going to go for the Merchant of Steel. Getting an upgraded unit is uh, really, really important early on. So let's see what's here available. Immortal Stone can make a unit endless. Endless on an Imp unit can be particularly good. Can also improve the base stats with a Battle Stone or a Heart Stone. Before we spend any money on these, let's see what the Banner unit contains. Ah, an Animus of Will. Ooh, I like that. Animus of Will plus Hornbreaker Prince plus Endless Imp. Sounds kind of good, actually. Will we be able to keep our units alive? I have no idea. Awoken Hollow can be decent, too. This unit gets... Uh, buffs the stats of the weakest unit every time you heal it. Miskatonic Blue, thanks for the 300 bits. And Scoopakins, thanks for 33 months. Greetings to the Variety YouTube. Indeed. I'm going to take that multi-attacker. And I'm going to buy Endless for this Imp. I wish I could afford a Battlestone or Hearthstone, but we actually don't have enough money. Oh, that's right, because you're not offered challenges during the first run. Oh! I was like, I knew something was missing. 
Your first run in Monster Train is is quite fundamentally different from the others. So there's a there's a few mechanics that aren't uh, aren't going to be shown here, but I think for this tutorial style run, that's actually going to be a good thing. So our second combat, we've now got these spike support units that provide spikes to other enemies on the same floor. So something that we're going to see a lot here is Hornbreaker Prince being drawn alongside Animus of Will on turn one. So we get a base of five cards per turn. It's not always random from your draw pile, what you draw. You always draw your champion as your first card of the combat. And then additionally, you always draw at least one unit or uh, so-called banner units from your deck each turn. These are units that you got from a banner or card reward uh, and are essentially all the, the all of the strong units from each clan, but not the starter units or weak units like imps. These are guaranteed to be drawn at a weight of, rate of one per turn. So currently, as long as we keep Animus of Will as the only such card in the deck, it will always be drawn on turn one. This is not random. So I think the goal here is to stack Rage on these multi-attackers by having this Endless Imp repeatedly die on the front line here. And I actually want this Imp to be dying. So we'll, we'll let you take four. It's fine. If I kill the Conduit Redirector, you won't have spikes and then the Fledgling Imp won't die. Let's just do this. So as long as the Imp is killed, we can resummon it, and that's going to let us stack more of this Rage Daz effect, which is good stuff. And then again, intentionally allowing the Imp to perish. So something to note about um, unit cards here is that uh, when you play a unit card onto the field, it's removed from play, so it's, uh, it's essentially exhausted. And that means you won't be drawing it again. This can make playing your units the first time you see them quite important. Additionally, units that die go to the exhaust pile, unless they have the endless property like this imp does. Note that we can even place the imp in front and then intentionally kill it with our torch spell to get the imp back next turn again with the endless property and keep stacking rage. So this second boss is very easily dealt with because of this immense damage we're able to do. By stacking Rage. GG, nerd. Optimal camera spot is on the left. Interesting. I'll have to think about that. Three armor. Fortify is kind of a weak armor spell, but it can be useful. Armor 5 is just not that much worth it for one draw. Imps that deal damage could be nice, the Molting Imp. I can also skip for 10 gold, which can be quite nice. I'm going to do that. I don't think I want any of these cards. Glimmer can be a very good card to boost. Restore two health to friendly units and deal two damage to enemy units. This affects every enemy on every unit on the floor. And this is a good candidate for boosting with the magic power uh, spell upgrade, which will improve its numeric effect by a flat value. Let's take a glimmer here. Give us a glimmer of hope. And we'll want to visit a merchant of magic so that we can upgrade that. Although grabbing an artifact. Very similar to the artifacts of Slay the Spire. It can be really nice, too. Probably want to get more unit upgrades. I really wish we could get more money. We're very poor at the moment. Card removals are very good. Hmm. Redshift, thanks for the nine months of the Prime Sub. Welcome to the Cozy Sub Club. 
Uh, sorry, these are similar to relics from Slay the Spire. Permanent passive effects that go on the top of the screen in a row. So, going to Merchant of Magic would allow me to purchase an upgrade for Glimmer, maybe one of our other spells. Getting an artifact could be a very useful passive effect of some kind. We also get our first Concealed Caverns, similar to the events of Slay the Spire. Problem is the lack of money for that Merchant of Steel next floor. I, I don't think I can justifiably go to a Merchant of Magic right now. Which means we won't be getting this Glimmer upgraded for a long time. That's questionable at best. But I'm here to make questionable choices. Let's do it. Take the artifacts. You get to choose one of two from these. Oh, and we got some really good ones. Split Anvil. When you play a spell, spells in hand that cost less than the spell you played become free. That can be very, very useful, especially for the Hellhorned, who've got a lot of three-cost spells. Or, Emblem of the Exiles. At the start of turn, each friendly unit... Uh, sorry, the front friendly unit on each floor gets five additional health. And we got some pretty weak units, so I like that quite a lot. Maybe a little odd with the Fledgling Imp, but regardless, going to allow us to tank a lot better and stack the Rage. I quite like that. What's this Hellhorn unit? The Branded Warrior. On killing an enemy, applies Rage to friendly units, or the Horned Warrior has Multi-Strike. I don't necessarily need another unit. It might be good to have something that's on a different floor. It's two different Multi-Strikers in general could be good. I'm thinking the Branded Warrior might be especially nice. Hmm... These are both units that need a lot of defensive support. Let's try out the Horned Warrior. And what's our event? Cave of a Thousand Eyes seems to awaken as you grow near. You can offer either coins or health for a chance to gain an artifact, and you're allowed to do this over and over again. I think we'll lose some health here. Healing is quite limited in Monster Train, but uh, we have some to spare at the moment. A loud belch emerges from the shadowy depths. Your worth has yet to be determined. Over Only further tribute will sway us further. So now it's 25%. Yeah, kind of like Scrappoos from Slay the Spire. 50% chance. There we go. Pyre Wall. Your pyre starts each battle with armor 15. This is a really good... Um, really good... Artifact. Because it essentially means we, we don't take the first 15 damage of each combat. And that is really nice. It means you can let a couple of weak enemies slip by. Sea Leader, thanks for the Prime sub. Welcome to the Cozy Sub Club. Alright, now we have to prove our mettle here. Daedalus is our first major boss. You fight these every three combats, or more specifically on combats 3, 6, and 8. Unlike regular bosses, these bosses are present on the battlefield every turn right from the very get-go. He moves between floors freely, but can be attacked if we clear out other enemies on that floor. In addition to that, the boss is going to employ a gimmick each turn. In this particular boss's case, summoning a bomb. For most of the major bosses, there are three or four different variants that you can face. So each uh, encounter with them is going to be a little bit different. I think we want to set up in the middle here. Going bottom, middle, or top is always a tough choice on each combat of Monster Train. Uh, often going at the top can be better because it means your your setup of creatures has more time to prepare for the earlier waves of enemies, and you have more rounds you can soften them with spells. But it also means that if anything gets past your battle line, it's going to immediately go to the last shard of the pyre. However, because we have the pyre wall, I think that's actually a good idea. Let's set up on top here. Let's pick off these one health enemies with Glimmer. And then I guess we'll weaken you, although it might be better just to do two damage to the boss. Oh wow. So that Emblem of the Exile is going to be helping a lot here. Stacking health on our commander. Another useless bomb? Good. Let's do Train Steward Horn Warrior in the middle, so the m these two can start softening up enemies before they go up to the next 
tier of the wedding cake. And I think I'll play this train steward on the bottom. It's going to get killed immediately by these enemies, but that means we won't be drawing it again, and that's a good thing. Note that the health boost from the Emblem of the Exiles happens after the fight on the floor. Alright, here's our Imp. Imp can actually absorb the hit from the bomb while also boosting the rage of these two, meaning we'll do more to the boss. That's perfect. That's what you want to see. You die, please. This enemy has an encant keyword. Pro tip, many enemies and effects will have purple circle symbols on them. These always indicate some kind of triggered effects with the exact symbol indicating um, specifically when they occur. This enemy gets a boost whenever we play a spell on their floor. This activates at the end of the turn. There are several other types of purple activated icon. All in all, it can be a little bit difficult to keep track of all the mechanical effects going on in Monster Train, but overall I consider it to be a simpler game than Slay the Spire, because you have less important decisions to make. That guy down on the bottom there. Cool, and we're able to hit Daedalus for quite a lot there. Nobody's getting anywhere near the top. The way Monster Train feels out, play, feels a little bit like uh, Tower Defense meets Deck Builder. It's quite nice. Here, we'll summon the Imp on this turn, on this floor. Give these guys a boost. Kill the bomb? Yeah, because currently the Forge Disciple's hitting the Imp and the bomb is hitting the Train Steward. Let's kill the bomb then. Note that it is possible to kill the boss before it actually enters combat properly, like it normally would when the waves expire. Glimmer is perfect here. Wipe out these fools. Keep raging on this floor? Sure. Alright, so now Daedalus gains the Relentless property. He'll fight like a normal boss from here on out. I think he'll die to our second floor. Not even going to get to the top. What a stinker. Get him. Steward bops the boss. GG. You also get a score bonus for killing the boss earlier. That's what boss rush here means. So after beating a major boss, you get lots of money, a rare card pack, Leech the Wildwood, heal to full Impalate. Deal damage to the front enemy equal to 15 times the number of Imp units in your deck. Currently 15. Even if it's only 15, that's actually not bad. You can easily get more Imps. Oh, do I want more Imps? And then we'll be offered a choice of three cards after that. Hmm. These aren't particularly amazing on their own. Spike of the Hellhorn gives you rage and armor. That's nice, but it requires... It's not enough rage or armor to be worth it for an X-Cost card, in my opinion, usually. Is there any indication for the rarity? Yes, the dot in the center of the card is the rarity. Purple indicates rare. Blue indicates uncommon. And white indicates common. Good question. I guess I'll try out Impolite here, but I don't actually think it's going to be very good. Ooh, Steelworker. 
After combat, supply armor 5 to friendly units. So this gives 5 armor to everything on the floor every turn. That can be a quite nice way to uh, start getting defensive. It's probably the last unit I want to grab. You don't want to take too many units in Monster Train. You'd rather have a, a, a couple highly upgraded units rather than too many unupgraded units. So let's take the Steelworker here. Awoken Hollow is also nice and chonky. Uh, although I'd need to be able to heal a bit better for this to be a good frontliner. It's also a 3-pip unit, unlike the Steelworker. So, after beating a major boss, you get to choose one of these three. Fellow's Remorse, Herzl's Compound, or Light of Seraph. Kind of equivalent to the boss relics of Slay the Spire. Either choose more Ember per turn, more card draw per turn, or more capacity on each floor. Exactly which one you want is really going to depend on what you've made so far. But uh, generally speaking, I have a very high opinion of the plus draw. It's very difficult to get draw effects in Monster Train, uh, where it's kind of easy to get more capacity or more ember from cards. You can't get card draw. Very, very few cards draw cards in Monster Train. So I think that's what I'm going to take first. I'll probably take one of the other two seconds. But that's going to let us get our stuff in play quicker and more reliably, and that's quite important here. Any way to restore Pyre health? Yes, these Pyre remains on the map are one way. You get 20 health for visiting them. Definitely want to go to the Merchant of Steel here. Still not very rich, though. Money's very hard to come by on the first Monster Train run. We can also upgrade our Champion at the Dark Forge. And there are two versions that we can get. Either Brawler, which gains additional multi-strike, or Wrathful. Gain Rage when taking damage. Gain Armor when killing a unit. That can allow us to build up some tanking power from behind the Steelworker. I really like that. That's right, there's no pack shards in the first run. Yeah, let's cross path into Wrathful here. This also improves the base stats quite substantially. Although the extra hit on the multi-strike is very good. Notably, if you go all the way into the multi-strike line, you attack five times per turn. Which is a little absurd. I think Wrathful will be excellent here. And we're gonna remove two Train Stewards. Some of the worst cards in the deck are the Stewards. You really want to get rid of them pretty quick. And what upgrades have we got available? Endless Spikes. A battle stone. Battle stone's pretty good on the Animus of Will. Give it some more damage and some more health. Spikes would be okay on Steelworker. Note you can also pay 50 for a reroll to generate three new upgrades. Money is so hard to come by on this run. Merchant can also pay uh, purge cards for money, too, which is quite nice. Okay, we'll put thorns on the Steelworker. Give it a bit more health. Paying for a reroll seems ineffective, so I'm just going to buy one purge here. we can put some cash together. Gary Spaceman, thanks for two months. Oh, now trials are available. So, undergo trials for greater risk and reward. If you activate a trial, you will face an additional challenge during the battle. In this case, enemy units appear on each floor at the start, but will also gain more money. Mark of Invasion is one of the easier ones to handle. Uh, de the, whether the trial is worth it entirely depends on which enemies you're facing and how your deck is. Some trials, especially on the higher covenant levels, can be very, very, very difficult to handle. But this one should be easy, and the 150 gold we get will help a lot. So we're going to take the fight for, with uh, the extra challenge for sure. This is our first encounter with curse enemies. These absolvers are real problematic. So these are the bonus enemies. And here's an Absolver. 
after combat, adds a Weight of Contrition card to the top of the draw pile. These are cards that you have to either play or take damage. Which can be really annoying. Oh, but Spikes can deal with them. Um, in combats where there are Absolvers, you're pretty incentivized to set up on the bottom. These Sycophants come in a horde and kind of buff each other when they die. Best way to kill them all is at the same time. And, and actually, because we have 15 Pyre Armor, we can just let all seven of these units go past us and focus on the bottom here, which is what I'm going to do. So we get 20 and 25 by two. Is that enough? No. Hmm. Bummer. Alright, fine. We'll get a curse. Show everybody what they look like. Oh yeah, and Collectors. We haven't seen these prior either. Collectors are enemies that appear on the second turn... I was wondering why we had no money. These appear on the second turn of each non-major boss combat. And they're kind of like a little treasure goblin. You have one turn to kill them. And if you can kill them, you get bonus money. You go in front because you're tougher. Of that, and I actually think I'll put the imp on the bottom. Skip the horned warrior for now. These get killed by the pyre, these get killed by the animus. Summon the imp. And yes, the pyre attacks with AoE, it's quite powerful actually. To the front with you. Hornbreaker Prince is gaining a ton of armor. Good for him. Turn respite before the boss. Remember, we can kill our own imp if we want to, and we do want to. All right, looks like everything dies. Notably, these absolvers are actually dying to the spikes on the steelworker. Actually, really glad we made that upgrade happen. So they'll die even faster if I do it like this, right? Behold our power. And this is usually what you need for success in Monster Train. You need a defensive plan, a way to gain health and stay alive versus the attacking enemy units, and then an offensive plan, a way to buff your offensive stats to be high enough to kill stuff. Hmm, I think a horn break might be a good idea. Piercing deal damage twice. This allows me to snipe some of the nastier enemies in the late game. Could take Ritual of Battle for way more rage. Ritual of Battle is actually one of the better cards. But it needs better upgrades. Upgrades we can't give to it right now. I'm taking Hornbreak. Could take another Glimmer. Steel Enhancer's fun. Give plus three, plus three to a unit. It's not much stat scaling, but I like it on the Animus of Will. I like it on the Hornbreaker Prince. I like it with our bonus card draw. It's okay. I'll take it.
And I would like to go to the Unstable Vortex, get two cards removed, and get 75 more gold here. We'll also be able to look at a few trinkets and maybe purchase one. Then I'll go to the Merchant of Magic and the Merchant of Steel. Oh, interesting. No Merchant of Magic here. Hmm. So we'll get rid of the last train steward, and I think I want to start removing these torches, especially now that we have better offensive cards like Hornbreak. The restores are pretty bad, too. Let's actually lose a restore first. Getting card removes is very important now. So are any of these worth buying? Enemy units get minus one damage. Apply days to enemy units when they enter the pyre room. No, those are all pretty weak, actually. These aren't very good relics. Artifacts, excuse me. Winging Indulgence could be quite nice. Just making, in particular, uh, Seraph hit for a little bit less is definitely valuable. So this is okay. It's nothing special. And we'll see another... Oh no, there's not a guaranteed Merchant of Trinkets later. Hmm. I still think we'll do better at the other Merchants. But I will buy another Purge on a Restore here. Yeah, all of those boost the pyre, which you can actually make a pretty powerful pyre. We have in the past killed the final boss with our pyre alone. That's pretty fun. Oh, here we go. This multi-attacking boss is one of the nastiest in the game. And this trial's no joke either. Non-boss enemy units do six more damage. Means they are really tough to deal with. And we have to have a good defensive plan or we'll get overwhelmed. All for 150 gold, it might not be worth it. Is it worth creating the extra shop removals? You can remove as many times as you want at shops. So, usually not. You can... You can save up and buy multiple removals at the same time. Hmm. We also have to deal with stealth units here. Alright, I'll do it. We'll want to set up on the top for sure here, because these stealth units can't be attacked during the first round of combat. That's tricky. But they're weak to spells. That's a lot nastier, though. Piercing goes through armor means this guy just dies outright. Perfect. Easy. All right, now the money's flowing. Got this. So these... Overcharged tanks are one of the enemy types to be aware of. They gain armor whenever a unit on their floor dies. Which can be really annoying to deal with. Keep boosting. I guess we just keep putting the imp down here. Stack rage on these two. Seems reasonable. Otherwise, the infinite dying time. Snipe these two. Kill the imp. Oh. So by default, the harpy actually kills them both. Let's see if the imp can make the difference here. Yes, it can. GG. Ooh. 
let me be free. All right, we get tons of cash. Now we're looking at a reasonable amount of money. Battering Ram. Damage to the front enemy unit equal to four times the amount of armor on friendly units. That's kind of funny with um, with Steelworker, but it's not going to be nearly as much damage as we want it to be. We could take Inflame for some more Rage and Armor, but it's just not enough for one card. I really think we need higher impact cards in this. Rage Serum's okay. Consume keyword in this is same as Inspire. You can only use it one time. Now, Invigorating Solutions, a card I like a lot. Draw three more cards next turn. Restoring Retreat could be interesting, too. Restore health to a unit and descend it. Descend, the keywords Ascend and Descend can be used to transition your units between floors, and that can allow you to stack more units on a floor than would normally be allowed, which is quite strong. That said, I'll take the solution here. And we're going to the Merchant of Magic again. I don't really have any cards that are particularly worth duplicating at the moment. We need to get our existing cards upgraded further. Too late for advanced prototype. We already removed all the train stewards, but giving stewards more uh, more stats is quite nice. The Queen's Tale says, when you summon your first imp unit each turn, gain an energy and draw a card. Well, that's amazing because we have an endless imp, so we can summon an imp every turn. It's basically one energy and one draw every turn. Oh, and Holdover is here. Holdover is a very powerful... Effect to put on a card. Holdover says, when played, put the card back on top of your draw pile. That's pretty good. So you can just play it over and over again. Useful on, for example, Steel Enhancer. But I also like it with a bonus on Glimmer. So that we can do like 10 damage to a floor every, wa every wave. Let's put Consume on one of these torches. Make you free. Unfortunately, Double Stack doesn't work on Steel Enhancer. Okay, 10 magic power, that's what I wanted. But yeah, you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot Double Stack Steel Enhancer. Because it, it is a direct stat boost rather than status effects. It's not rage. Unfortunately. Free horn break is good. So we have 395. We don't have anything good to double stack, right? No. Double stack can be very, very useful. Doubling the magnitude of a spell effect, but we don't need it here. All right, and what's in the caverns? I should have looked at the caverns before I bought stuff from the merchant, but that's all right. Hellborn, how fortunate am I that our travels have finally crossed paths. I'm recording the events of Armageddon for posterity. Possibly futile, I know, but I shall make a fortune if you do somehow succeed. Would you characterize yourself as honest, aggressive, or stealthy? For honest, we get a one-time gold gain card. For aggressive, our Pyre does more damage based on our money. Or if we're stealthy, we get the Petty Theft spell. This is good in the early game. We're a bit late for this. Honest is fine. Don't think we need aggressive for this run. I'm honest. Interesting indeed, and quite uncharacteristic of Hellborn, though by no means unwelcome. Perhaps those good intentions will carry us past these dark times. Here's something for your assistance. Best of luck to you in the battles ahead. Alright, Fel's going to be our second major boss. This is the Absolver version of Fel, which is going to be extra nasty. We have to deal with lots of curses heading our way during this battle. That's going to be tough, but good luck to us. Fel has some of the best music, in my opinion. 
Clipped Absolver's Guard fell to weigh you down with guilt before the warrior can make her killing blow. Remove these weights to thwart their assault. Fell and her allies will add Scourge cards to our hands. Boy, will they ever. Fell is always your second major boss. Uh, actually, no, that's not true, though. You might also fight Arcus. One of two possible second major bosses. Excuse me. She's always got statues and one of three different gimmicks. Definitely want to set up on the bottom here to kill these Absolvers each turn. Although we may not be able to get them on turn one here. Not quite. So if we don't pay two energy for this card, we take five damage and we'll draw the card again. How rude. Can't, failing to kill this Absolver means uh, that we get another curse, but it's not as bad as this curse, at least. And we at least get rid of this statue, meaning we'll be easy, more easily able to kill other units in the future. Thankfully, she's not going to do that every turn. Otherwise, this would be pretty insufferable. Get rid of that one with Glimmer. Play the Weight of Contrition. And I think I'll put the Steelworker on his own in the middle floor. Seems like he's doing okay. Again, question mark? Question mark. I want the Hornbreaker Prince to be getting the kills here. Do that. And get rid of this card. Consume it. Placed in the consume pile. Thank you. Free now, that's good. Get the boss then. Seven by two. It's fine. Uh, anyone missing any help? No. Okay. Get a little bit of damage in on the boss is always good. How does regen work in this? Great. Identical to Slay the Spire. Uh, like the inverse of poison. You heal for an amount equal to your region, and then your region goes down by one. Good question. Give me that imp tail bonus. We redrew the steel enhancer. That's cool. The stats. All right, everybody important is in play. Good. I'd say regen not as not as useful as in Slay the Spire, especially not if you're playing with the Last Divinity DLC. We don't have the Last Divinity enabled for this run because this is the first run on a new save file, but we'll be playing with it as soon as it becomes available through normal unlocks. So regen one says restore one health at the end of your turn and then lose it. Zabonavaz, thanks for 42 months of support. I do highly recommend the Last Divinity DLC if you're considering this game. It makes the game a lot more complete, gives you a lot more decision options, and just in general makes it way more fun, if you ask me. Alright, we get some really good damage in on Fell this turn. Actually should have just played the Gift of Gratitude there. GG.
Like that pro tip there. Speed up combat with the speed up button. Yes, I highly, highly recommend the DLC. Ooh, double the amount of armor a unit has. That can be very, very useful on our Prince, especially. Cycle of Life is also interesting. Apply 10 additional max health and spikes three. Note that this does not consume, so you're allowed to stack spikes permanently multiple times. Something to note though, our final boss is a version of Seraph that is gonna remove buffs from our units, so I don't think we wanna take spikes because those are gonna get purged by our boss. So now that we have consumed, more energy seems reasonable. I'm also very, very happy to take extra card draw, base seven draw per turn here. I think with the units that we have, we don't want additional capacity on each floor. So it's either remorse or compound. Let's see, what is the path I'm taking? Merchant of Steel, Merchant of Steel? Yes. Yes, and that's gonna be another four Carter moves too. So we're gonna lose basically all the, the basic stuff. Okay. What am I what am I going to be left playing? We'll find out. Just like in Slay the Spire, getting rid of your starter cards is highly advised. All right, we choose to advance on one of the two paths of our champion here. Either Wrathful, gaining more armor per kill and more rage per hit, as well as scaling our base stats further, or Brawler, giving us more starting armor and a third hit per round. I think I want that third hit. 15 armor to start is also quite nice. And let's get some unit upgrades. Multi-strike means our unit can attack an additional time. I like uh, times four attack on the enemies. Let's put spikes on the steel worker, make him spike six. That's actually pretty good. Except against Seraph. Battlestone here. Let's reroll one more time. Endless again. Ten more damage on Horned Warrior, or do we want the health? Health seems like it might be more broadly useful. I'm gonna leave the Strength Stone as it is. I guess that means I don't need to go to another Merchant of Steel, huh? We got all the upgrades we wanted. Which means we could go for a dupe. Noted. There's no merchant there, right? So if I go this way, I have no way to spend any of this money, which means I would want to remove now. But then I'm not getting much removed. Tough choice. Hmm. Once you have two upgrades, you cannot swap them out. Slots are full and you cannot make any more choices. So you have to really commit. It is possible to get more than two upgrades on a card, but you have to do some special ways to make it happen. Unboss enemy units enter with five spikes. I think we can deal with that. I don't know if I'm going to actually use the 400 gold, but I'd like to have it. This enemy is the living armor. This boss gets stronger every time they're damaged, which makes them quite a tricky predicament to deal with at times. Yeah, the spikes are going to make these gilded wings in particular really nasty. Hmm. One wonders if we've made a mistake. Oh good, hold over glimmers here. You can go in front, buddy. 
We can heal ourselves too. How nice. 100 additional dollar bucks. Nice. Here, you come to the front. Perfect. Does anyone have a reasonable amount of armor to double? I could double the 20 on the Hornbreaker Prince. You just wait a little bit and do better than that. Let's gain 120 bucks. This is our last chance to do it anyway. Sixty armor, that's a bit better. Note how the Endless Imp is also serving as a, a huge damage mitigation for us, because it's often absorbing the first enemy hit each round. That's quite nice. And a reminder that you're allowed to kill your own imps. For fun. GG. All right, don't, don't want to play too many cards against the living armor. This enemy gets plus one to its base attack power every time you damage it. So doing things like playing torches for low amounts of damage can be very bad against this particular enemy. Don't do it. Don't do it. That's some good damage output. Hornbreaker Prince is doing a very good job here. Once again, we're offered Battering Ram. It looks a lot better now than it did before, but I still don't think it's that useful. Because it's hard to get armor in the first place. Could take another Invigorating Solution, or once again, Spikes of Life is a little tempting, just for the 10 health. Take another Solution. We have so much money, it's very tempting to go to a merchant, just so we can afford removals here. I could have remove both torches and the remaining restore. I could even get rid of something else if I wanted to here. Like Vine Grasp, although I like Vine Grasp to kill... I could get rid of Impolate, which is not that good. Yeah, I'd say Impolate's not very good. Although it's a fine card to keep in the deck and just get a early mastery on. Oh, that's right. We don't we don't even uh, benefit much from mastery because we're not doing a divine run anyhow. So heck it. We'll have to remaster that card anyway. So let's just buy some purges then. At this final store. The goal is remove all the unwanted stuff. Purge. Impolite. Bridge. Restore. And we can afford one more. We could even get rid of Hornbreak here. Let's get rid of this torch. That way you don't have to consume it in the first place. Alright, so here's our final battle. Wave 8 is always the battle against Seraph, who is... Definitely a very difficult opponent when you're first starting out this game, figuring out uh, how to deal with Seraph, especially the particular version of Seraph that you matched up against. Seraph has absolutely enormous stats relative to what you've seen before. 2300 health for us here, and he'll attack three times per round. He also summons lots of annoying enemies, which can be especially problematic. 
Here, we want the Hornbreaker Prince at the very, very top to stop Seraph, so let's put Hornbreaker here, Horn Warrior in the middle. Pick off these annoying things. Definitely too early to reinforce here. Yeah, new save file Seraph's pretty spooky, actually, before you unlock the first Covenant level and some of the other stuff that goes with. Alright, Steelworker, show them how it's done. Note that Seraph will be repeatedly purging our buffs, which is going to be extra annoying. some damage here to Seraph. That's fine. Kill those two. So no more cards to draw. We're currently drawing basically every card in the deck each turn, because there's very few cards left. That's actually quite good. I think that means I can also do Steel Enhancer, Fledgling Imp, and then replay the card that I just played each turn. Right? If I understand this correctly, we get to do Steel Enhancer, Imp, Steel Enhancer every turn. That's good. That's really good. That I like. Where to that? That's right, buffs are anything that's green. That's what Seraph is going to remove from us, is any green icon. Armor is not a buff in Monster Train. But the game does make it quite clear. Buffs are green, debuffs are red, and yellow is neither a buff nor a debuff, according to Monster Train. Oops, forgot to play the Steel Enhancer before I did that. I was explaining things. This is already going really well. Yellow is a status. Okay. Very generic phrase, but I'll take it. We're actually not stacking much armor on the Prince because we're not letting him get kills, but I think that's fine with the way this is going so far. So not replaying my Steel Enhancer for some reason because I can't remember to do it currently. Oh, there's a sleigh. Good. Should be able to slay this thing, too. So, Steel Enhancer first. Perfect. Steel Enhancer. Alright, there we go. That's correct. So soon Seraph will become relentless and into the train. It'll be next wave. Twenty-five armor on the Hornbreaker, that's perfect. So we'll play reinforce next turn. Whoops, again, apparently. <laughs> really can't remember that very well. Correctly. 
All right, here we can double the 95 armor that he's got. Make it up to 190. That seems pretty good. Pick off all these minions. Seraph's not going to have much of a chance against this. Yeah, he does 30 damage per turn, 2,000 health. We do 300 damage per turn, 200 health. That'll be plenty. Plenty. GG, Seraph. He gets through a lot of our health, though. We actually we really had to rely on this setup and uh, and execute on it well for it to work. I really don't think the first run of Monster Train from a fresh save is, is all that easy to win, so pretty thrilled we got there. GG. Speed that up a bit, hey? Victory is ours. Hey there. If you enjoyed that video, watch this one next. And before you go, join us on Twitch and watch live. I'm there five days a week playing Slay the Spire, answering questions, and chilling with the community. Click the link in the description to follow right now. Ta-ta for now.